Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This video is going to have all kinds of fun things in it. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple cool plants. We're going to plant a couple plants. Uh, I've got video from California Spring Trials where I was out there last week uh, looking at some, some pretty fun plants that were on display out there. There was some painting uh, this past week and uh, talking about some tagging too. So this video is just going to be all kinds of all kinds of fun things out here in the garden in Raleigh, North Carolina, Zone 8A. And we'll jump right in and talk about the Golden Falls Red Bud. The Golden Falls Red Bud is, you can see, I think this is kind of not quite peak bloom today, but close enough. I think we'll be losing some flowers about as fast as we gain any at this point. There's more flowers on it this year than there has been in the first three years it's been in the ground, or close to four years it's been in the ground. So. Uh, we're having a, we're, it's on a positive trend, <laughs> that's what I would call it. It's nothing like the native red buds, which have, you know, flowers basically for all the way on the oldest part of the trunk, all the way up through the plant and all the way, uh, all the way down. So, but it's better. It's much, much, much better. And if you follow along with the channel, this, this tree doesn't really need to flower because it's going to leaf out right behind the flowering with these big, beautiful heart-shaped chartreuse color leaves that just light up this garden. I mean, it is the centerpiece of this garden. Everybody wants to know what it is in every video if they have, haven't followed the channel for any length of time. And so it's one of our absolute favorites. It's basically has gonna have to be staked probably forever. Uh, it's, uh, you can see even up here where it's not staked to the post, it's got a little bit of a lean in it. it, it if, if I unstaked it tomorrow, I think it would be, you know, really weird looking by the middle of summer even. Uh, so I know that about it, uh, and that's okay. Uh, no, no big deal because it's such a center focal point to this bed. One of the two plants I'm going to add to the garden in this video is a Mojo Pittosporum, and we already have three of them. Uh, if Steph could pan back here uh, where Holly is hanging out, there are three in the bed across the pathway in the back, and they're just as happy as they can be. You see new growth is coming out on them uh, at this point. They just they look absolutely fantastic. They're just like a light back here in what is a little bit of a shady, a shady dark space. And, you know, just from a design perspective, and we, you know, this garden is like one of everything, right? We're one of everything. This will be one of the few plants that we actually have multiples of. And sometimes I like, if I have a group of three, you know, in a foundation planting, we'll probably do this on the front foundation planting somewhere is to put a group of three, you know, we always say buy odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, you know, when you're designing. Sometimes I actually will buy an even number and then put like three on one side of the foundation and then carry one over to the other side or five and three or five and one, whatever it is. And it just kind of looks like you, you had an idea about what you were doing before you ever started. Uh, and so you pick up one here and then as you turn the corner here, there's three uh, over there. We're going to add a little few more of those kinds of things into the garden uh, over the course of this spring just to kind of maybe tie all these one of a kinds uh, together. Uh, and we've got this perfect, perfect little spot in the curve uh, back here. We've tried, we try to get most of our planting done before we're mulching, but we've got 27 different jobs going on and I need to get the driveway cleared. So I've got one spot here where I haven't planted, where I had mulched and so I'll make sure I pull this back really well. I don't want this hardwood mulch down in the hole. It's, if you get a little bit down there, it's not like it's, not like it's, a, it's gonna panic me or anything like that. Uh, but I do try to get that moved. Our soil has completely changed. It's just so wild to me. When we first started this project four years ago, there's no way I could have done this, which is just with taking one, one hand and I can bury, ultimately bury that shovel down in the ground. It's just wild. Uh, there's a holly that has volunteered here. Um, and I actually dug enough of it out of the ground if I wanted to transplant it somewhere and find out what kind of holly it is. We could, but I think we, we've got plants checked off the list back here. There are some roots in this back area because we have so many trees back here behind us. That didn't offer a whole lot of resistance, so 
that's good. A lot of, again, a lot of soil improvement back here. There are a few roots that creep in from the space behind us. This prefers part shade. Uh, it's kind of the ideal place for it. So it's gonna get a good amount of direct sun on it for some portion of the day, but probably no more than about four or five hours of direct sun. And then the rest of the time it's in part shade. It's pretty much equal to the other three in terms of the distance away from the woods back here. So I think it, sh it should be perfect. I love these as they're putting on that little bit of new growth right now. It's kind of a, a slightly different, more kind of a more of a chartreuse color. And then it fades into like a light green with a, a whitish or off-white variegation on it. Really quite beautiful. They will get some flowers on the interior that are fragrant. Uh, not as many as some of the other green varieties of Pittosporum. Low doming habit, as you can see on those other three, it may reach three feet in height at some point, but it seems to want to stay under three feet and just get wider than three feet. So probably closer to four. It can be pruned. I pruned on the, uh, uh, our green Pittosporum over here last year um, that it, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't even have a hiccup. Um, came right back out of it. So easy to maintain, easy to prune, part shade is best. One thing I want you to notice on the bottom of this there are, you're going to notice this more and more as you're buying plants now. These are rice hulls that were on the top of the soil mix uh, for, this, for this container. You're going to see this more and more. There's a lot of nurseries experimenting with ways to reduce weed in the nursery with less chemicals. And so we're, we're seeing lots of different options being presented as a way to basically put a barrier on top of the soil to prevent weeds from germinating just acting as a mulch, but it needs to be super light and fluffy in a nursery setting because they, they irrigate so much. So it's, this particular one is rice holes, but we've seen other things in other nurseries being used. So don't panic if you see this you know, on top of any of your root balls of the plants you're buying. Because we're, again, we're gonna see it more and more. The nurseries are trying to figure out ways to reduce you know, chemical use for a lot of different reasons, for just from one, the cost of it. Uh, you know, and, and the application of it and their employees being exposed to it and all kinds of things. So kind of neat that there's looking at options and it's a byproduct of, you know, growing rice. So that, that's kind of interesting. This is a Southgate rhododendron. This is Southgate Breeze. There are several of these in the series uh, from the Southern Living Plant Collection. And I was out at the California Spring Trials last week and a couple of these Southgate series rhododendrons were in full bloom and I kind of walked through the space there at the uh, Southern Living Plant Collection and Encore Azaleas and uh, Better Boxwood and uh, talked through some plants and so um, that's what we'll do next. This one is about to uh, come into full flower. I think we're going to enjoy the flowers on this one and then after it's done flowering we'll put it in the ground. Uh, but these just become absolutely spectacular spectacular flowers over the next few weeks. So let's go out to California and talk about some plants. I'm at the uh, Southern Living Plant Collection, Better Boxwood, Encore Azalea, and Sunset Plant Collection spaces out in Santa Barbara, California for the California Spring Trials. It's Bohemian Beauty Lakothui. We have one of these as well. I haven't shown it off very much, but Really interesting plant, really interesting Lakota wheel. Uh, variegated at times and uh, different kinds of variegations. Uh, soft caress Mahonia. Pierre, Mountain Snow Pieris. Just about finished flowering. They brought these from Alabama, mine at my house in Raleigh. A little further north is still blooming a little more than that at this point. These rhododendrons are just these Southgate rhododendrons are so good. And these are heat tolerant rhododendrons that were bred for the south. Down here a little lower, there's some spider's web fatsia. Everybody knows, maybe my one of my top plants in the Southern Living Plant Collection is this Burning Love Lakothui. What a great plant this is. The abelia here, there's Miss Lemon. And then that suntastic pink straight ahead there and then suntastic peach we just planted one along the street at the house in raleigh love that plant and then there's a, a roman candle podocarpus in the back corner 
Dragon Prince Cryptomeria in front of that. Look at that thing. It's absolutely perfect. And it's in a full three gallon container. And then I'll back out and show this red sky, Sky Pencil Holly right here. It's got all the new red growth on it. Mine's not growing yet in Raleigh. It's a little early yet in the season, so it's not colored up com like that. There's some purple pixie laura petalum. Purple daydream laura petalum. Shown off this touch of gold holly a bunch of times. Great looking plant. The mini touch. This is similar to soft touch, but it's even smaller. And this is a great little boxwood replacement. Um, tiny little compact Japanese holly. And then uh, Nandina is the lemon lime Nandina, obsession Nandina, and blush pink Nandina. Three of them side by side. These are ones that don't fruit and uh, don't flower, so they're not uh, not invasive. And then the uh, Bayou Bliss Distillium. Cast in Bronze Distillium. I'm looking forward to mine having this new growth on it. Look how nice that new growth is on Cast in Bronze. It's a great looking plant. There's Mood Ring Podocarpus back here. Ours is now about six feet tall in the garden at the house. And then there is some limited availability out in the world now on Better Boxwood. I'll be showing off the better four. I've got all four Better Boxwood uh, varieties in the garden at the house in Raleigh and look forward to showing those off uh, this next year. But it's, um, they're four, basically four different shapes. You got Babylon Beauty, Heritage, Skylight, and Renaissance. Uh, Skylight is probably going to be the top seller it's the it's the boxwood boxwood i mean it can you can do anything with that one upright and narrow christmas tree shaped perfect little round ball anything you want to do with it uh then the sunset plant collection is in here with it as well this plum power lavender has bees coming from everywhere i was here last year at cast and that's the was the theme of this was just how many bees they went home and told he told the others and brought all their friends. Uh, it's Platinum Beauty Lamandra, I've shown off a bunch of times on the channel. Beautiful plant. Spinning around this way is the Encore Azalea site. A bunch of autumn fire in full bloom. And then there's Autumn Moonlight, which is the new variegated one probably going way too fast for people but I had a minute to do this it looks like autumn lilac along the back it's not tagged but I'm pretty sure that's what it is autumn majesty the purple one in the back is so good uh, the ones we planted for some friends last year uh, coming into coming into bloom in the neighborhood I saw the other day so I'll film these when I get back home as well and then this is autumn starburst which has the uh, really beautiful variegated flower there. Okay, I'm gonna spin around here. So, and get around here to the agapanthus in the middle. Right there, the big group of beautiful agapanthus. This is Ever Twilight. The one with the purple and the purple and white. Look how nice that is. And then this is ever white. I have several ever white in the garden. This one's been super reliable in my Raleigh garden, coming back vigorously and blooming uh, really well. And then ever amethyst. We also have the purple one. It's back toward the back. Uh, the one up on the middle. Uh, is blackjack and it is definitely the darkest purple color that I've ever seen in agapanthus. Don't know what the availability will be on these this year. They'll be out in the world for sure, but I doubt there'll be a whole lot of them. But this is one that people are going to want. It's agapanthus blackjack. A couple other things here. This is that clean sweep snowbank Indian hawthorn. Here it is in full bloom. I haven't shown it in bloom yet. I've shown it at the house a couple of times and we planted it 
on another landscape job, but I haven't shown it in flower. That, that's what it'll be like at the house. Probably just after I get home, uh, it'll be in flower like that. And then this is the uh, Chef's Choice Rosemary. And that planting at that landscape job, I have two or three of the Chef's Choice Rosemary planted around the snowbank Indian Hawthorn. They got four of the gardenias from the collection here. They got Jubilation, Full Proof. Full Proof and Jubilation get approximately the same size. Full Proof is very similar to Frost Proof, but it's more compact. And you can actually see that right there if you're familiar with Frost Proof Gardenia. And then Diamond Spire is the upright narrow one. And then Scent Amazing, the one on the far right, that thing blooms like crazy for me. Uh, it's a single flower rather than a double, but it just blooms and blooms. One of the things about the newfound space that we have everywhere, we have foundation back here to plant. Uh, actually, the turf area where stuff is filming from right now is going to be, be evolving. We, we know how that's going to be. That'll be an upcoming video. Uh, we're moving, we're going to be moving some plants about. We're taking out a couple of older things that we kind of tried to rejuvenate that were already here in the garden uh, that are going to come out. And a couple th things are moving around. We want to make sure we get the bulbs in the garden tagged. Uh, Steph will map them out, you know, on, on drawings, but this particular season, over the next few months, we're going to have so much intense work going on out here. We wanted to tag uh, all of these clusters of daffodils. There's more daffodils than anything, but we have other bulbs as well. We have lots of other bulbs. They're all going to get a tag in the ground. So you can use, you know, these are plastic uh, tags. I had boxes of thousands of these left over from the nursery and I'm still, and I'm still using them, but you can cut up plastic bottles and all kinds of things, any kind of rigid plastic that you want to cut up and you can use charcoal pencils or you can use uh, a permanent marker that's um, specific for outdoor, uh, for outdoor use because otherwise that ink will fade over some period of time. Uh, so, you know, uh, use what you have, hopefully, uh, but make sure it's some sort of the writing on there is going to stay on there. You can also come back with these. If we decide to regather them out of the garden later this season, you can actually scratch that off of these plastic tags and then write something right out, you know, on them uh, immediately. Or if you use charcoal, it'll, it'll come off a little easier. But Basically, stuff has just marked the groups. These are Barrett Browning daffodils, and we'll know they're there, and we'll know these are here. And then there's a group of uh, pink charm daffodils that are there. So as we're digging out here, and there's some Tahiti daffodils back here. They're almost, a lot of them are almost finished. The Tahiti still look pretty daggone good, really. Uh, and, and some of these still haven't opened yet, but that's what we're doing. Uh, one of the one of the operations here is to make sure before these bulbs start to go to sleep with all the things that we're going to be doing out here and rearranging out here that we're not going to be digging up bulbs and damaging them because we really have some pretty well established established groupings out here that look pretty daggone good in their second season i expect in the third season of some of these bulbs being in the ground or second third fourth depending on how long they've been in the ground just get better and better every year i don't want to start damaging them now This is another species tulip that we have in the garden. This is the Turkestan tulip or Tulipia turkestanica, I think is what it is. Uh, they're about to finish up and we hadn't filmed them. I, I wish we'd have shown them a little earlier because they were definitely a little bit a little bit showier than this, but this is a species of tulips that's native to Central Asia. It doesn't need quite as many chill hours as some of the other tulips that we use in our garden. So these are fairly reliable coming back for us in the Raleigh, North Carolina garden. They're kind of earthy. I mean, they're not the showiest, they're not the showiest flower you'd have in the garden, right? But super, super interesting to have a, you know, a species tulip like this that will come back and it's unique, not something everybody's necessarily going to have uh, in the garden. We actually got these from Color Blends and they've, they've performed beautifully out here. And, and there's there, I think there were like a hundred or something like that in the package. So we put 25 in each spot. So immediately they would make some sort of impact in the garden during this first season. The gray ghost Elysium is putting on a show. These kind of have pinkish white, a pinkish white flower. And you can see the interesting, interesting, interesting flowers on these are one amongst the oldest 
evolved flowering plants and we have uh, several of them uh, native to the southeast United States. This gray ghost has a really interesting variegation. It's got green with a creamy white variegation and when the new growth comes on it it'll have that little bit of chartreuse color that we saw on that mojo pittosporum as well. This thing has not transitioned extremely well into the ground over the last couple of years but it has come into full flower uh, this time around uh, and it's you can I can see new growth coming from every direction but it is much thinner than it should be coming out of winter it definitely has lost a few leaves from uh, th this red bud that's behind where stuff is filming right now is very well rooted in here if you're gardening with an with a native red bud uh, you'll know that the roots just run pretty wild all over the place plus they seed themselves too so they can be you know problematic to garden with a little bit although beautiful and native and the native bees were all over that thing a week ago uh, but this thing has had some transition problems going into the ground uh, but I think this spring it's going to be I think it's good to go now uh, and it's got it's in it's in good shape and it's flowering well and new growth is coming but excited to see it when it's really leafed out fully because when it went in the ground initially it lost a lot of leaves and it's never gotten back to where it was but it's on its way this uh, osmanthus um, we talked about in the weekly garden planner uh, about plants stretching a bit in too much shade so this is what this thing's been doing and we cut it a little bit last year it's got the beautiful new foliage on it after it it's almost finished flowering and i'm going to give it a little bit of a a little bit of a haircut off the top one more time um because you know some of these things if they're in a little too much shade while you can still reach them it's a good idea to do a little bit of pruning on them and see you see how full this is down here at the bottom uh, fuller um, from my haircut I gave it last year. If I, do, I feel like if I do that one more time while I can still reach it, I'll get more growth down in here and it'll be full all the way down to the base. And one other thing before we jump in and plant another plant, this Juliet Claire is just an incredible show off in the garden and that, that variegation on it, I've talked about this plant a bunch because I'm so amazed by every leaf looks like it was painted on the plant. They're, every one of them is individually different. Creamy white variegation with green in the center and then it looks just you know like paint streaks on it. When it's first leafing out in the spring, it has a bit of a pinkish hue to it. It's a great screening plant. I mean, it's gonna get some size to it over time as you can tell, but these other things were planted at the same time and they're eight feet tall. Okay, so that's, you know, that'll tell you how uh, how much slower sometimes variegated plants are, you know, and sa same thing with that, uh, the Elysium over there where it's got that variegation in it. The green Elysium we have over here in the corner is eight feet tall. And that one, it, it went through a transplant shock, but it's also just it, overall just slower in general. But we figure we had Romeo or Juliet on this side. And so let's jump over to the other side and put in a Romeo. This is Romeo Clara, which is gonna have a similar growth habit to uh, Juliet over there, you know, six to eight feet in height, you know, maybe five or six feet in width, ultimately. Uh, they prefer, you know, part sun to more than a half a day sun for sure. I'm probably gonna have this one in a little bit too much shade uh, back here. It's high shade though, and this red bud is up high. So I'm hoping that as the sun slips past that it, it'll get enough sun back here. If it ends up a little bit thin, because I'm not relying on this as a, a flowering plant, I can do a little bit of shearing on it to keep it fuller, but it's gonna be a bright spot up against the, uh, the blue color on the house. We haven't really planted this area next to the screen porch in this corner. One reason is, is because the blue siding ended in this corner and the green siding picked up there for like almost two years, <laughs> over two years. Uh, and we just have finished the exterior of the house and uh, just finished painting the foundation and have done, you know, made quite a few uh, improvements and changes uh, to the house and now we're again landscaping this little corner back here but this is one of my this is one of my favorite plants in the southern Living plant collection we've never put one in the garden here this one instead the uh, juliet has kind of a creamy white variegation and romeo has more of a chartreuse or yellow uh, edge on each of the leaves but other than that very very similar very very similar plants you can see how compact uh, this one is growing with i'm sure they sheared it a couple times in the nursery but 
We're gonna put it back here in this corner and just let, the, let it be between these two windows, something with some size. So hoping to maintain it maybe about my height ultimately. Of course, that'll be several years because again, these variegated plants aren't gonna, they're not, it's not like they're gonna race out and just be done uh, overnight. That went in really easily. I did not know because this red bud that's over here beside us is you know, just roots everywhere. And I just happened to hit a spot where there wasn't some major, major root from that red bud. So now we have Romeo and Juliet, Clara. Clara are just great uh, ornamental plants for Southern gardens. These are, you know, zone seven to 10 uh, and pretty, pretty, you know, really, really easy. They can get quite, quite big over time. So that's where some of these new ones come into play. Like we have Leanne in the front garden out there that ultimately will get eight or 10 or 12 feet tall, but we can keep it smaller. It's not in the giant hurry that some of the old Clara, straight Clara Japonica were. And then Romeo and Juliet with this variegation in them, you know, you can definitely control, size control them over some period of time, or just put them in a mixed border and let them go. They're just great, great screening plants. If you're in zone seven, with these Clara, I probably wouldn't put them out on the border if it was like really super windy area. Okay, I'll just throw that out as a disclaimer. Probably eight to 10 in open areas, zone seven, this kind of space where it's slightly protected is absolutely ideal. You'll notice I don't amend the soil here. I don't have to. If, we back, if you back up and restart this garden, you know, four years ago, we put down some compost or wood chips or a combo of the two and now and then we've mulched this space five six seven times at this point not a big thick layer i mean you just saw me put this i just raked this mulch out after i put that in the ground and it's it's only like this thick so i'm not putting these layers of mulch like this i'm letting this mulch almost completely disappear before i put the next layer on i don't want it piling up and piling up and piling up so i'm careful with that i'm we are mulching frequently but we're not mulching super thick. So that's something that may confuse people. I, you know, I'm not, it's not mulching because today's June 15th and I'm going to mulch. I'm, I'm thinking through how thick should it be in order to make sure it's almost completely disappearing before the next round of mulch goes in. Cause that mulch breaking down is what's feeding everything. It's what's creating an opportunity for earthworms and other things to be helping me. And so four years in, I just dig a hole. I put the plant in the ground and I walk away. I don't really need to think about amending the soil at all, uh, which is, you know, kind of nice. It just takes a minute though. It doesn't, and everything's not gonna be perfect the first 12 months, first two years even that you're in a garden, but over some period of time, and anybody who's watched this since the beginning, you know, I could have taken the shovel in a spot like this and it just bounced it on the ground. Uh, and now I can take it in one, you know, one kick into the ground, bury most of that uh, trenching shovel. I do have a new trenching shovel and I've showed it off in a video not that long ago and it's it's the same exact one it's this much longer but I still like this one I just like using this one so you'll you'll you know you'll probably rarely see the new one because <laughs> uh, I've broken this one in uh, and, and I in, and enjoy using it so there you go there's some fun and interesting things going in in the garden that mojo pittosporum I think helped with the design back in that back corner this again carrying something that's similar across the path filling in a corner in the house we haven't been able to do anything with because it, construction uh we, we you know the house was basically under construction for some period of time there and a few things out in california and a chair got painted on the front porch so there you go thank you guys so much for following along tons more activity like this coming up in the next few weeks so please subscribe to follow along